الحمد للمتوحد بجلاله المتفرد وصلاته دوما على خير الأنام محمد والآل أمطار الندى والصحب صحب عوائد لا هم قد هجم العدا من كل شأو أبعد هاوين ذلة مهتد باغين زلة مثبت لا أختشي من بأسهم إذ من دعاك يؤيدي فإلى العظيم توسلي بكتابه وبأحمد وبطيبة وبمن حوت وبمنبر وبمسجد وبمن أتى بكلامه وبمن هدى وبمن هدي وأدم صلاتك والسلام على الحبيب الأجود والآل والأصحاب هم أوايا عند شدائدي وجعل بها أحمد رضا عبدا بحرز السيد اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق والخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهادي إلى صراطك المستقيم وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم وبعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وأيدهم بروح منه صدق الله العظيم Esteemed and honorable ulama, teachers, respectable elders, youth and youngsters, my brothers and sisters in Islam By the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we assemble here at Noor Jami Masjid Preston to celebrate and commemorate the life achievements and works of who was truly a saviour of Islam <coughs> the luminary of the Indian subcontinent the greatest scholar of his era the greatest alim of his time the greatest mufti of his time the greatest mujaddid of his time the greatest imam and muqtada and leader of the Muslims in his time Sayyidi al-Shah Imam Ahmad Raza Khan from Bareilly Nabar Allah Marqadahul Kareem we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes this majlis of ours one of nur, ilm, hidayah, guidance, light and connected with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his friends and we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counts every breath that we take in this majlis one that is written in the majlis of ilm and nur and hidayah and inshallah may our meeting be one that is forgiven in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may our du'as be accepted and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enrich our hearts and enrich our souls with the nur of his friends, of the awliya Allah and of the pious imams and ulama of this deen. Ameen, 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 bijahin nabil, ameen. Honestly, it's a very difficult task uh, to speak on Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Raza Khan rahmatullahi ta'ala because he is so versatile and there's so much diversity in his life, in his writings, in his teachings, in his vision, in his impact, in his services, in his contributions, in his celebrations, in his achievements. That's really beyond, uh, this is a disclaimer by the way, it's really beyond what a speaker can cover in, uh, in a matter of an hour or even a few hours in a day. When we look at this great Imam, he is a mufassir, an exegete of the top class in his era. He is a muhaddith, rather imam of muhaddithin in his time. He is a faqih, a jurist consult. He is a marji, a point of reference for thousands of ulama in the world and thousands of Muslims in the world <coughs> from various continents. He, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, is an author. He is a mudarris. Muhashi, Muhaqqiq, Mudaqqiq, Usuli, Mutakallim, Faqih. Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Ali Rahma is a Muhaddith. Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Ali Rahma is a Sha'ir. He is a writer of poetry and excellent in that. He is a Mutarjim of the Quran, a translator of the Holy Quran. That in itself is a massive achievement. He is a Mufti and a Mujtahid fil Masail in the Hanafi Masail. And he, in the classification of mujtahids we have in the Hanafi school, he sits on the third class of mujtahids. 
You have Mujtahid Mutlaq, like Imam Abu Hanifa. Then you have Mujtahid Fil Madhab, like Imam Muhammad. And then you have Mujtahid Fil Masail. Sayyidi Imam Muhammad Rida Khan is a Mujtahid Fil Masail. Radiyallahu ta'ala anhu in the Hanafi school. And that aside, Sayyidi Imam Muhammad Rida Khan is a Mujaddid. Mujaddid of Adab, Mujaddid of Etiquette, Mujaddid of Ishq and Love, who reignited the fire of love in the hearts of millions of Muslims. Through his Adab, through his example, through his life, through his following and emulating of the Sunnah, and through his Hadaiki Bakshish. That itself is an entire topic on its own. Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayh, also is a mujaddid of uloom, the mujaddid of sciences. He mastered over 55 sciences, 21 of which he studied with his father, and the rest, most of them he studied himself, and then he authored in all of these sciences. And he left books. And inshallah, today we will look at some of his service, services, inshallah, azza wa jalla. And what we can tie this to is that he was so versatile, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent him in a time of Turmoil in a time when deen was weak, religion was weak, politically we were weak, religiously we were weak, socially we were weak, economically we were weak in the Indian subcontinent. This is the 1856 I'm talking about, when he was born. And so, 1272 Hijrah. When Sayyidi Imam Muhammad Rida Khan rahmatullahi ta'ala, was born, there were so many schisms, so many fractions and denominations of Islam, and so many people misrepresenting Islam. And so there is a hadith in Sunan Abu Dawood, which is one of the six canonical works of hadith on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Hurairah radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Inna Allah yab'athu li hadhi al-ummah ala ra'si kulli mi'ati sanatin may yujaddidu laha deenaha. And in a narration other than Abu Dawood, may yujaddidu laha amra deenaha. The Prophet ﷺ said, Indeed Allah sends, okay, or indeed Allah will send, at the end of every 100 years, a person from this ummah who will revive the deen for its people. And the revival of the deen, okay, so the sign of the Mujaddid is that he is always at the end of one Hijri century and lives across it to the next century. Uh, of the Hijrah. So Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was born in 1272. He crossed through 1300, 1301, all the way to 1340. And so in terms of the hadith, this is the foreknowledge and the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. That he knew that, even though with Khatm al him being the seal of prophethood, that there will be no prophet after him ﷺ, but there will be revivers of the deen who will carry out the tasks of the Prophet ﷺ in connecting the deen, people to the deen and they will be his heirs, his inheritors who will preserve the original and pristine form of this religion from all misinterpretations and misrepresentations. And in every century Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made true this prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the first century sent Khalifa al-Muslimin Umar bin Abdul Aziz, the first mujaddid of the first century, passed away in 101 Hijrah. Look, he crossed over 100. Passed away in 101 Hijrah. Khalifa al-Muslimin Sayyidina Umar bin Abdul Aziz. In the second century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Hashimi Imam Sayyiduna Imam Muhammad bin, Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i, the Imam of the Shafi'i school. In the third century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam Abu al-Hasan al-Ash'ari, the Imam of the Ahl sunnah In the fourth century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made true this prophecy, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the great Imam Abu Bakr al-Baqillani, the Imam of the Ash'ari school. In the fifth century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam Muhammad bin Muhammad bin Muhammad al-Ghazali. Imam al-Ghazali. He was Muhammad, his father was Muhammad, his grandfather was Muhammad. And in the sixth century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi, the great Razi, his tafsir, Mafatih al Ghaib, you've heard of it. And Asrar al Tanzil, his other tafsir, which is less famous. In the seventh century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam ibn Daqiq al Eid. In the eighth century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Imam Zainuddin al Iraqi, who was the teacher of Al Hafidh ibn Hajar al Asqalani in Egypt. 
in the 9th century Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Hafidhul Millah Imam Jalaluddin al-Suyuti the one who said he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam awake 75 times Imam Jalaluddin al-Suyuti was the mujaddid of the 9th century in the 10th century Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Mullah Ali al-Qari in Makkah al-Mukarramah the great Hanafi Imam al-Mujaddid the author of al-Mirqat in the 11th century Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Mujaddid al-Alf al-Thani Sayyidina Shaykh Ahmad Faruqi Sarhandi, Imam Rabbani from Sarhand in India, North India, Punjab. In the 12th century, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the author of Musallam al-Thubut, Allama Muhibullah Bihari, rahimahullah ta'ala, and also Sultan Alamgir, the Mughal emperor was a mujaddid. May Allah bring that glory of Islam back, the one who, uh, the one who commissioned the writing of Fatawa Hindi Alamgiriya. And among his senior ulama, the most senior ulama who overlooked the fatawa Hindiya was Mullah Jeevan Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayh, who is the author of Tafsirat Ahmadiyya and Nurul Anwar, which is study in Usul al Fiqh. This was the mujaddid in the 12th century. And by the way, you can have many mujaddids in a century. And so there are, these are some mujaddids. In every century, there were multiple mujaddids who renewed the deen in different ways. In the 13th century, you had, uh, in the 12th and in the 13th century, you had the son of Shah Waliullah Ahmad al-Dihlawi. His name was Al-Imam Abdul Aziz al-Dihlawi. Al Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlawi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu is that Imam that today, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Mecca, Medina, and the rest of the Muslim world and the whole of Africa, they trace their scholarly heritage back to Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlawi in Delhi. Like when we were studying in Damascus in 2002, when I was studying in Damascus 2002-2003, our teachers used to find pride in saying that our grand teacher is a student of Shah Abdul Aziz al And so we have a very rich history and legacy of scholarship in the Indian subcontinent and the whole Arab world today in the African world and the various content, uh, uh, the various countries of the, the, of the Muslim globe they are connected to Delhi Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlawi whose grand student is Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Raza Khan and Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Raza Khan Allah Ta'ala sent him as the mujaddid of the following in the 14th century Imam Ahli Sunnat, Kushtai Ishq Mahabbat, Mujaddid Adin O Millat, Malhazi Anzari Nubuwat, Hami Sunnat, Mahi Bidat, Sayyidi Asha Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, Fazil Ibrahim Birati Allah Ta'ala. So there is this succession of Mujaddidin and they all have things in common in reviving the religion of Islam. Now, Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Raza Khan, all of these were ulama Rabbaniyin. All of them were Rabbani ulama. All the Mujaddids were Rabbani. Rabbani means they were godly. They had the akhlaq of Mustafa shining in them. The lure of Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shining forth from the akhlaq, from the adab, from their sleeping, their waking, from their walking, from their talking. And from their words came rivers of wisdom. From their pen flew oceans of knowledge. Who is an alim rabbani? Who is an alim rabbani? I want to say this in Urdu because of the sweetness of Urdu. Alim Rabbani kaun hai? Zaban par farmane Mustafa ho. Subhanallah. Aur dil mein faizane Mustafa ho. Zaban par farmane Mustafa ho. Aur dil mein faizane Mustafa ho. And Alim Rabbani is the one who utters the hadith and the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he promulgates the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to people. And his heart is an embodiment of the love of Rasulullah and fondness of Rasulullah and carries the grace of the Prophet So he was born in 1856. A little bit about his family and his upbringing. So this is a lesson for all of us on how upbringing is done. He's born in the house of Wilaya. Nur, Ilm, Hidayah. Father is one of the greatest scholars of his time. Mufti Naqi Ali Khan and his grandfather is also alive and those who have grandfathers you are lucky because you get to see the generation of your elders Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan's grandfather is also alive when he is born Mufti Raza Ali Khan and he is the most senior Mufti of his time and so Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan does not have internet does not have Wi-Fi does not have mobiles does not have YouTube does not have Netflix does not have all this garbage to clutter his brain his brain is a plain canvas 
for the greatest imams of Ma'rifah and Wilayah and Nur for them to inscribe their Nurani writing on his script, on his heart, on his slate, on his mind, on his spirit. And so Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan is born in a house that is free of clutter. You understand this? Not only is it free of clutter, okay, but a house that is filled with nur and wisdom and knowledge and fiqh and sunnah and love for the Prophet and connection with the awliya in particular, Al Ghawth Al Azam Mahiddin Shaykh Abdul Qadir Al Jilani. From a young age, he saw the gathering of Huzur Ghospak in his house, he saw the Milad Sharif on an annual basis in his house. And his father took very special care in teaching him. His grandfather said about him, Ye mera beta bohot bada Ali Medin hoga. Through his foresight, through his firasa, he saw that this son of mine will be a huge scholar of his time. And so they gave him very special care. And so Sayyid Imam Ahmad Khan, at the age of four, he began his Bismillah Khani, which was a tradition in the Awliya Allah, just read the Bismillah Khwani of Hazrat Qutbuddin Bakhtiyar e Kaki. How the awliya came to make him read the Quran. Always take your child, by the way, always take your child to read the first sabaq with one of Allah's friends. Get them, get them to teach your child Bismillah rahman rahim Officially, when you start the study, take your child to a wali or a friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you see how, inshallah, with the barakah of that Bismillah rahman rahim your child will fly, inshallah, azza wa jalla. And so at the age of four, and this is the way of the awliya, at the age of four, they start their, four according to the lunar calendar, moon calendar, they start their children. So this is just close to being four in the solar calendar. Uh, he recited Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and started his studies. In that very year, he finished the recital of the whole Quran. The whole Quran, he finished in one year. When kids don't know about themselves and they can't maintain themselves and can't sit straight, Imam Ahmad Rida Khan finished the whole Quran at the age of four. Finished the whole Quran. And then he began starting Mizan, Munsha, these books in Farsi from the age of four. In a maktab with a teacher. And he started studying with Mullah Ghulam Qadir Beg, Rahmatullah Ali. Now, this teacher, Mullah Ghulam Qadir Beg, who began teaching Allah, the elementary of Farsi, Urdu, Arabic, from the age of four, five. Okay? He, later on, when Imam Ahmad Rida Khan grew old and became a teacher, he was alive. And he became a student of Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. Imam Ahmad Rida Khan taught him Hidayah and Fiqh. And when Allah Hazrat went to Marahra Sharif to become a murid, he went with Allah Hazrat and also became a murid of Shah Rasul Rahmatullah Ta'ala Allah Hazrat's teacher, first teacher. And so, uh, in the Islamic sciences, and so by the age of six, he was so eloquent in, in these two years of study. He had studied Seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Akhlaq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Shama'il of the Prophet. Everything was done with his father at home. He had studied and he, with the Islamic syllabus on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He had taught his son so well that by the age of six, age of six, now imagine our children and us at the age of six. Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, in a house filled with listeners, he addressed a gathering of Milad Sharif for two hours. And how old was he? Six years old. On the annual Milad Sharif, that his father conducted every year in his house and Allah has kept that going through his entire life. On the 12th of Rabiul Awal, the Mahfil of Bareli in the house of Mufti Naqi Ali Khan. Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma delivered his first ever speech at the age of six. For how long? Not a written speech that he was reading for 10 minutes, for two hours. Isn't this Allah's gift? Subhanallah. <laughs> Don't we call this a gift of Allah? Isn't these, aren't these early signs of what he is to become? Anyone can gauge that. Any sensible person can gauge that. Okay, and this is written in multiple biographies of his. Okay. At the age of eight, he had finished studying Ilmul Mirath. So we talked about Sirajiyah. He finished studying Sirajiyah by the age of eight. And he was capable of writing fatwa in inheritance matters. SubhanAllah. Once his father left the Darul Ifta and a question came and he saw the question there on the table of his father 
right? And it was a question about inheritance division. And Sayyidi Ala Hazrat wrote the response and left it on the table for his father to see. And his father came back and he said, Are, who wrote this? And this, uh, I said, oh, this looks like Aman Mia's writing. He used to call him Aman Mia. He said, this looks like Aman Mia's writing. He said, Aman Mia, you're too young to write fatwa. He's nabalik, right? He said, Aman Mia, you're too young to write fatwa. And he was not fully trained. But then he said, Koi bada is ka jawab likh kar to de. The answer was 100% accurate. And it's show me an elderly person who could write the response like this. These were his comments. At the age of nine, look at the syllabus he's going through now. So Siraji at the age of eight. By the age of nine, okay, he was studying, he had finished studying Sharhul Aqaid and Nasafi of Imam Taftazani. I've been constructing this very careful biography of Sayyidi Allah Hazrat through a, putting together a jigsaw of loads of manuscripts and books and published articles and magazines, etc. Right, and trying to go to the original first sources, to the biography and his own handwritten stuff. So Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Rahma, by the age of eight, uh, by the age of nine, has finished studying in Islamic theology, Ilm al Kalam, Islamic beliefs. He had, he had finished a book which today in a classical Dars and Islami syllabus you'd study in the year five. Right? And like you finish Sharul Aqaid and people will call you Allama Sahib. Right? Imam Ahmad Al Khan had, at the age of nine, right, had finished studying that was studying books like Mullah Hassan and Mantik etc. at this age and Sayyidi Allah Hazrat in Arabic wrote his first ever epistle, his first ever book in the Arabic language at the age of nine. On a, on a masala of Aqeedah, on the sifat of Allah, on the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This masala was, is one of the most difficult masalas of the of ilahiyat, of divinity. Sayyidi Imam Ahmad, and you know what? That book that he wrote at the age of nine is published and is available. The first ever book he wrote. It's called Al Qawlun Najih. And then it's published in this new edition of Fatawa Radawiya, this one. In the old editions, it's not in it. They found it and they published it, the scholars did. And he wrote uh, a marginal uh, hashiyah to it also, Sayyidi Allah Hazrat all in Arabic, debating with the Mu'tazilites and the philosophers and responding to the different sects. About the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge, his, his irada, etc. Subhanallah, at the age of nine. At the age of ten, Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Adha Khan is studying Musallam al Thubut. In one of the last books, he studied in Usul al Fiqh on Islamic hermeneutics. At the age of ten. And he begins writing his hashiyah, his Arabic commentary on this at the age of ten. And around that time, his grandfather passes away. Mufti Raza Ali Khan, rahmatullahi ta'ala. And then from that age onwards, and all of this is, Allah Hazrat didn't go to school, college or university. But he became an encyclopedia of sciences at home. Shows you what home education can do and what it can achieve, right? He became a polymath, right? Not just in Islamic sciences, he became a master in maths, sciences, earth sciences, astronomy, astrology, etc. It's very vast what he covered. And he left books in Persian, in Urdu, in Arabic on these uh, on, in these various fields. Subhanallah. By the age of 13, he completed the entire syllabus, and that's approximately a, a rigorous 9 to 10 year syllabus with his father of the Alim course. Okay? And he finished 21 sciences with his father. 21 sciences. Now remember, every science, if you're going to study tafsir, if you're going to study hadith, there's going to be an elementary book, then there's going to be an intermediate level, then there's going to be advanced. He finished all the levels in 10 years. Right? With his father at home. Subhanallah. He was so eager to study that Fridays was his day off, like when he was about five years old, four years when he used to go to the maktab to study the early books of Sarf and Nahu and Farsi, that even on Fridays he would get ready to go. And his father would tell him, no, today's our special day, Jumu'ah, we don't, we don't study on Fridays. And he would study six days a week, Sayyidi Allah, when he was four or five years old. So stop wasting time with your kids at home, basically. Stop cluttering the brains of your children, right? Replace the mobile phone and the tablet and the, the screen. Honestly, it is so crippling our society and deteriorating our people. And we have 
sadly to sad to say dumb people coming out of of schools of education systems you know who cannot maintain themselves who cannot put together who cannot converse and put a sentence properly together and that is the problem that we are facing today in our society okay attention levels have been destroyed completely and it shows what can be achieved and what was achieved when the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is present the madad of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa is with you and when you have the right environment and people supporting you at the age of 13 he finished the Islamic sciences he graduated at the age of 13 years 10 months and 4 days exactly and on the night of his graduation he became baligh the very night he reached the age of puberty this is karam from Allah that very salah of fajr was the first fajr of his life how many of us can say I remember my first salah that was fought on me look at the upbringing he had he wrote down the date, the salah, and you know what? He never missed a prayer his entire life. He wrote that I am sahib tartib, that there is tartib in my prayers from my first fajr of that year. I've never missed a, he never missed a prayer. Subhanallah. <laughs> ta'ala anhu. And so, is this possible? Like, is this unheard of? No, you haven't read the biographies of scholars. We had geniuses. We have intelligent scholars, right? So, Allama Fazli Haq Khairabadi, who is one of the grand teachers of Sayyidi Allah, he also graduated from Tafsir Nizami by the age of 13. <laughs> also. Right? So, this is not unheard of. Imam Ibn al Hajib, the famous Ibn al Hajib, I was reading Imam Suyuti's book on Adab of Ta'lif, the adequates of authorship. He wrote that Ibn al Hajib at the age of seven, seven was writing books. At the age of seven was writing books. Right? It's possible when. They, you have the right environment, the right support, and obviously when there's tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and obviously the acumen, the, the intelligence of the child as well matters. Allama Abdul Haq Khairabadi, Fazli Haq Khairabadi's son, okay, he had written the Hashi of Qazi Mubarak in, uh, in Mantiq by the age of 13. Right, so some of this is beyond us, right? But what I'm trying to say is this is not unheard of. When you read the biographies of the ulama, Honestly, what they done for the deen to achieve the deen, if they had put those brains in dunya, they would have become multi-millionaires. But they put their brains towards the deen. To serve the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. And so this is a little bit about the background of the education of Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman. At the age of 20, now I just want to tell you what the elders, the seniors in his era, his meetings with them. So the, the, some of the greatest awliya that he met. Shah Fazli Rahman Ganj Muradabadi. Fazli Rahman Ganj Muradabadi was a student of Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlavi. So Allah had met two students of Shah Abdul Aziz al-Dihlavi. Sayyid Shah Ali Rasul, his own Biru Murshid, and Shah Fazli Rahman Ganj Muradabadi. These were the most senior scholars of the Indian uh, era at that time. At the age of 20, Sayyidi Allah had visits Shah Fazli Rahman, who was over 80 years old at that time. And when Shah Fazli Rahman finds out that Maulana Ahmad Raza is visiting from Bareilly, this very elderly Arif Billah Gnostic asks his disciples to lift him and bring him out to, the, uh, to, the, to, the, to receive Imam Ahmad Rida Khan at the beginning of his village. And he kept Imam Ahmad Rida Khan there for two nights, three days. Towards the last three days of Ramadan. Imam Muhammad Khan stayed there in the last three nights of Ramadan with him. And Shah Fazli Rahman Dan Muradabadi narrated to Allah Hazrat Al Hadith al Musal Salubil Awaliya, the Hadith of Mercy, which is Al Rahimuna Yarhamu Mur Rahman, Yarhamu Man Fil Ardi, Yarhamu Kuman Fil Sama. Scholars traveled the world to listen to this one hadith. It's called the Hadith of Masi. I taught it to my kids. I teach it to people because you should be aware of this. The Hadith of Masi is the first Hadith that you listen to from a teacher. And there is continuation of it being the first Hadith up until Sayyidina Sufyan ibn Uyayna. For over a thousand years, every student heard this as the first Hadith from his teacher. There's succession of it being the first Hadith that you hear. 
Shah Fazli Rahman Ganj Muradabadi narrated this hadith and it was the first hadith that Ala Hazrat Ali Rahman heard from him and this was the first hadith that he heard from Shah Abdul Aziz and that was the first hadith that he heard from his father Shah Waliullah and that was the first hadith that he heard from the ulama of Makkah al Mukarramah in his chains right so Shah Fazli Rahman Ganj Muradabadi and what does this hadith mean look at the first dars that is given ar rahimuna yarhamuhumur rahman those who are merciful allah the most compassionate is merciful towards them our deen is about mercy and the first lesson ulama give is of mercy this is the first dars allah has took from shah fazli rahman bin muradabadi those who are merciful allah the most compassionate is merciful towards them irhamu man fil ardi be merciful towards those who are on earth yarhamukum man fis sama the angels of the heavens will be merciful towards you Hadith of mercy. The hadith whose first hadith is mercy, how can that teach terrorism? We really need to revive this tradition of narrating this hadith. Okay? We have hundreds of years of history as this being the first hadith that a scholar teaches his students. The hadith of mercy. Al Musalsal bil awwaliyya. This tasalsul in it. In every generation, as I told you, the student is the f- is hears this as the first hadith from his teacher. Anyhow, Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahmah had this hadith from Shah Fazli Rahman. And then, by the way, when he went to Makkah al Mukarramah, Allah Hazrat narrated it to the Muhaddith of Morocco, Sayyid Abdul Hayy al Qattani, famous Muhaddith of Morocco, wrote over 70 books on hadith. Allah Hazrat taught him this hadith. They both met in Hajj in 1905. And you know Abdul Hayy al when he came back to his second Hajj a few years later, he was so popular as a muhaddith Abdul Hayy al who became a student of Allah Hazrat al Rahman. Abdul Hayy al Qattani became so popular as a scholar of hadith in his time from Morocco. Okay, he's buried in South France. He's buried in France, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He's a student of Allah Hazrat al Rahman. And the first khilafat that Allah gave in, uh, in Makkah al-Mukarramah, in al ajazat al Madinah was to him and his children. Okay, so anyhow, I'm going to go off on one if I carry like this. Sayyid Abdul Hayy al Qattani, okay, Sayyid Abdul Hayy al Qattani, when he came back to his second Hajj, okay, he narrated in a massive gathering in the Mataf, in front of the Kaaba, he narrated this hadith that he heard from Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman. After Allah Hazrat had passed away, many years after Allah Hazrat had passed away, and one of the scholars who were present in that majlis said, there were so many ulama and students of knowledge from Mecca and Medina from all over the world that sat in that majlis that the tawaf stopped. Because everybody was listening to Abdul Hayy al Qatani narrating the hadith of mercy. And this is what he heard from Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman. And he mentioned Allah Hazrat in many of his books. This is a different topic. He mentioned Allah Hazrat in numerous books of his that he heard this hadith from. And he used to take pride. And he used to refer to Allah Hazrat as a shihab, the star of this ummah. Everywhere he mentioned Allah Hazrat, he said a shihab, the star of this ummah. Subhanallah. This is somebody who spent just one morning after Tulu'u Shams till midday Zawal. He spent the whole morning with Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman. Imagine those who spent their entire lives in the company of Allah Hazrat. What did they see? What did they see? Right? And so, Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman so heard this hadith from Shah Fazli Rahman Ghadi Muradabadi, who's the most senior alim of, you know, one among the senior ulama of India. And from the last two students of Shah Abdul Aziz was him and Shah Sayyid Ali Rasul Maraharawi. Shah Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman, he was so inspired by Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman, these are the words he said, Mujay Aab me noor hi noor nazarata. And then he said, Ahmad Raza, I want to give you my hat and I want to take your hat. And he exchanged his hat with Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Rahmah for Barakah. To take Barakah from him and to give him some of his blessings. And that hat of Shah Fazl Rahman is still with the family of Allah Hazrat in Karachi, in Pakistan. And that's a very historical exchange and meeting because of Allah Hazrat was only 20. And Shah Fazl Rahman was the most senior scholar of his time. And what did he say? Mujay Aab me. Noor hi noor nazarata hai. Oh young man, I see nothing but light in you. And these are historical, this is the historical sentence that was documented by those who were attending. A similar kind of meeting happened between Sayyidi Allah Hazrat and the great 
Ba'alawi Sayyid of Makkah al-Mukarram. Sayyid Hussein bin Salih al-Shafi'i. When Ala Hazrat went to Hajj, the first time with his father and mother, Sayyidi Ala Hazrat was only 20, uh, 22 years old when he went to Hajj. And when Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Rahma went to Hajj, Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, uh, 24 years old, when he went to Hajj, Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan was praying Salatul Maghrib by Maqam Ibrahim. When he finished his Maghrib Salah, this great Wali of Allah, who was one of the great Awliya of Makkah al Mukarramah, he was looking at Imam Ahmad Rida Khan carefully, gazing at him. And he went up to Imam Ahmad Rida Khan, who was only 24 years old, and he took him by his right hand and he said, Young man, come to my house with me. All he said. And he said he didn't say anything to me, he walked me to his house, which was at Safa Mountain, where Jabal Safa is today, you do Sa'i there. And Sayyidi Allah said he, had made, he sat me down and he held my forehead. And he said to me, Wallahi inni la ajidu nur Allahi min al jabeen. By Allah, I see the light of Allah emanate from this forehead. And then he gave Silsila Aliya Qadriya Ahdaliya Ba'alawi Silsila Ijaza to Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma. And he gave Imam Ahmad Da Khan Ijaza in Hadith, in the six books of Hadith, etc. And for the first time, I want to mention this. I, Faqir, alhamdulillah, discovered that handwritten uh, copy, uh, a copy of the handwritten uh, ijaza of Sheikh Hussain Sa'ad to Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma in the library of Makkah al Mukarramah. Faqir discovered it, and alhamdulillah, I am in the process of publishing it. And I brought just that page with me today. And I've written a biography in Urdu and Arabic called Fathul Mannan. Alhamdulillah, which is several pages, tahqiq on who is Sayyid Hussain bin Saleh Jamalullain and his biography, Alhamdulillah. And for the first time after approximately 150 years, that ijaza, that license that he gave to Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Khan, Alhamdulillah, we now, now have in printed form, Bidhanillah ta'ala, very soon. So what did he say? And I want to just read to you what Sayyidi Sheikh Saleh, who is a giant Imam of the Ba'alawi Sayyids and the Wali, what did he say about Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma when he met Allah Hazrat? And he's only 24 years old. He said that فَقَدْ مَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيَّ بِالْإِجْتِمَاءِ فِي أَشْرَفِ الْبِقَاءِ بَعْدَ صَلَاةِ الْمَغْرِبِ فِي مَقَامِ سَيِّدْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ He said that Allah done a favor upon me that He allowed me to meet this 24-year-old young man. He said, Allah done a favor on me that he allowed me to meet after Salat al-Maghrib at the Maqam of Ibrahim alayhi salam Bishab al-Salih al-Alim al-Falih al-Murshid al-Najih al-Shaykh Ahmad Rida Khan He gave five titles to Allah Hazrat al-Rahman He said, Allah favored me, graced me to meet the young, pious, alim who is successful, who is a Murshid and who is a pioneer, the Shaykh Ahmad Raza The son of our master our Sayyid, our Shaykh Maulwi Naqi Ali Khan, because I believe he also met his father as well. And then he said, and now this is beautiful, he said, وَقَدْ طَلَبَ مِنِّي أَنْ أُجِيزَهُ Ahmad Raza Khan asked me to give him ijaza, to give him license to teach and study and spread the tariqah. He said, فَعَلَيَّ أَنْ أَسْتَجِيزَهُ لِفَضْلِهِ وَعِلْمِهِ I should have been seeking ijaza from this young man. Because of his knowledge and his excellence. Look at this. By the way, I have the manuscript for this if anybody wants to see it. <coughs> These are the scholars of Mecca. Right? And so it shows us the global relevance and significance of Sayyidi Imam Ahmad al Khan. He said, it was, my, it was upon me to ask him for ijazah because of his knowledge and his virtue. And then he says, but I, I gave him ijaza. Wanaji minna yakhudu biyadi akhihi. He said, on the day of judgment, I give him ijaza on the condition that if he goes to Jannah, he will take me with him. How amazing is that? This is what the teachers, the shuyukh, the awliya are saying about Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Rida Khan. And I, there's a lot that I can say. So these are. Two great giants that I've just talked about, Shah Fazli Rahman, Gaj Murad Abadi, who said, I see light and light light upon light in you. And Sayyid Hussein Ba'alawi from Mecca, who also said, I see the light of Allah emanate from your forehead. And these awliya were foretelling, foretelling through their firasa, as the hadith says, Allah gives them firasa that they are able to see through their foresight that this young man is going to be a huge scholar. Of the Ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. So, Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma, 
He serves this deen of Rasulullah in many ways. And one of the ways is tadris. There's four ways that you can serve the deen of Rasulullah as a scholar, right? Is tadris to teach, right? You, you produce scholars, okay? In a, in a classroom environment, teaching the books, etc. The second way to serve this deen is tahrir and tasnif and ta'lif is to author and write. And authorship, as Imam al we said, and Imam Sayyudi and at taqir din al-subki, at din al-subki, all the scholars said, that authorship is the most beneficial way to serve the deen of Rasulullah because books will remain. Books will? How do we know about Allah Hazrat today and why are we sitting here? Because we have his books today. This is why we can tell you what he wrote, what he thought, what he contributed, right? And this is why Sayyidi Allah Hazrat established a publishing house in Bareilly. And you know where he is buried today, Allah Hazrat's blessed grave, is in the place of his printing machine. He lived in books and he passed away in books and he is buried in the place of his books. Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Rahma wrote, guided the Ummah. This writing was for the guidance of ulama to even today the most difficult masalas that come to the Ummah today, the muftis run to fatawa radawiyah to see if we can find guidance in his fatawa. And he dealt with some of the most difficult topics of his time like the banknote, right? What is the ruling on the banknote? You know, it's only a little piece of paper and it says 50 pounds on there, but the actual paper is only worth about 30p, 50p, but it says 50 pounds on there. Do you get it? So what do we give zakat on? The worth of the paper or the number written on it? Do you see how difficult the question is? Do you see the difficulty of the question? And what is the status of this? And etc. Allah has it, Rahmah. Even this question on the banknotes, it came from the ulama of Mecca. And he wrote this answer in just 18 hours in Makkah al Right? So this is the, the magnanimous mind of Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahman. Sayyidi Allah Hazrat taught for 54 years of his life. He did teach. He had um, his student, Walla Zafar, Zafar al-Din Bihari says, we never kept a record of his students, but if we did, and he was, by the way, the, one of the early students of Allah Hazrat when Manzar Islam was established. He said, if we kept a register, there would be thousands of students who studied with Imam Ahmed Raza Khan And when he passed away in 1340, 1921, 1340 Hijra, when he passed away, a list of the graduates of Bareilly was published and there were, in that year, okay, a list that was published, 300 ulama graduated. In the year that Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma passed away, can you imagine how much he benefited through Manzur al-Islam, his madrasa, and his teaching before that in his home. And in um, Lama Zafruddin Bihari, his students say there were students from Uzbekistan, from Bukhara, from Turkey, that came to study with, from uh, Bukhara. We had a student called Sayyid Abdul, uh, Abdul Ghaffar al-Bukhari who came, then he went to <coughs> Russia, and then the World War, Allah says we don't know if he passed away. Allah said, the ulama of Medina came to Bareilly to study. Sayyid Hussein bin Abdul Qadir, Hussein bin Abdul Qadir Madani came from, from Medina Sharif to Bareilly to study with Imam Ahmad al-Dakhan and stayed there for 14 months studying with Allah Hazrat al And his brother Sayyid Muhammad also came. Sayyid Ismail bin Khalil came from Makkah twice to benefit from Allah Hazrat al-Rahman's fiqh and his fatawa in Bareilly Sharif. The ulama of Makkah, which was the center of knowledge in the late Ottoman period, center of knowledge, they come to Bareilly to study with Allah Hazrat al What does that say about this person? What does that say about his centrality, his significance, his greatness, radiallahu ta'ala? And then in terms of his writings, and there's a few things that I do want to share today. And there's so many pearls and gems and hidden things in his writings. And in the last 15 minutes, inshallah, I would like to share a few things. So I have in front of me Imba'ul Hay. This is in Arabic. This is a tafsir he wrote in 500 pages on one verse of the Qur'an. And even this, the published edition, is incomplete. Like there's a white page at the end, meaning that it, it, they don't have the full copy of the book. In Arabic, he wrote a tafsir on وَنَزَّلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْكِتَابَ تِبْيَانًا لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ How the Qur'an is an explanation for all things. So, you know, where, where is science, chemistry? Where, where is uh, modern science and medicine and the world? Where, where are things mentioned in the Holy Qur'an? You know, non-Muslims say the Qur'an says that it's an explanation for all things. Where is it? So Allah Hazrat answered this objection and wrote an entire book on this topic. How the Qur'an is an explanation for everything. 
500 pages in Arabic. And in this, right, he, he has a section on how many times, and this is fascinating, how many times our one salah ala nabi when we recite salat and salam on the Prophet وسلم, how many times Nabi salam receives that? And he surveyed the hadith literature and he collected all the hadith that he could find. Imagine how many months it would take us doing that, right? And today with the internet, maktaba shamila and all these softwares, right? It's become easier and with AI especially, right? But Allah Hazrat had none of that. He collected all the hadith that were available to him. And what did he say? He wrote a section in his book saying, one Darud salam that you recite on your Prophet ﷺ, after studying all the hadiths, he came to the conclusion that Nabi ﷺ receives it 11 times. SubhanAllah. Imagine what it takes to get to that conclusion, right? One Darud salam that you recite, Nabi ﷺ receives it 11 times in different ways. And then he presented hadiths on every single way. For example, when you recite Darud Sharif on, on Thursdays, the day of Thursday and the night itself presents the Darud Salam to the Prophet The night and day present the Darud Salam to the Prophet Right? <coughs> then, there is an angel standing at the blessed grave of the Prophet who listens to all Darud Salam from all over the world. One angel that stands at the blessed grave, Muwakkal. He listens to all of the, and he presented the hadiths on this. And then, at your lips, there is an angel sitting at your lips at all times, waiting for you to recite Salat and Salam on your Prophet. That angel collects your Salat and Salam. That's all the duty of this angel. There are hadiths on this. When you greet your Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then there are Malaika Sayyaheen, who roam, the roaming angels they're called. Their job is to collect Salat of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he presents all the hadiths on this topic. I mean, how fascinating is that? Where have you ever read that? Where have you ever seen that? Right, that a scholar is able to survey the hadith literature and come to this, through his inductive survey, come to this conclusion. Right? Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Rahmah's ishq and adab for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's writing about the finality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? Nabi Islam is the final prophet and the Quran is the final message. So he presents this hadith. Nabi Islam says, Inni ashhadu adada turabi dunya anna musaylama takathab. Nabi Islam said, Indeed, verily, I give testimony by Allah that Musaylama is a liar by the number of particles on this earth. Nabi Islam gives testimony. Any a heavy testimony by the number of particles on this earth that Musaylama was a liar, was a false prophet. You understood, Ahmad? Musaylama al Kathab, who claimed prophethood after the, uh, 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 who claimed prophethood. Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, by the number of sand particles I give testimony by Allah, Musaylama is a liar. Allah Hazrat Rahma, when he sees Nabi alayhi salam is really extolling this issue, right, by saying, Ada the Torah bid dunya, Allah Hazrat alayhi Rahma says, وَأَنَا أَشْهَدُ مَعَكَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَوْرْ مُحَمَّدْ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ كِي بَارْقَاهِ عَالَمْ بَنَاكَ يَيْ أَدْنَا كُتَّا بَعَدَدِ دَانْ هَائِ رَيْكْ وَسِتَارْ هَائِ آسْمَانْ قَوَاهِ دَيْتَا هَيْ اور میرے ساتھ تمام ملائکہِ سماوات و ارض و حاملانِ عرش قوا ہے اور خود عرشِ عظیم کا مالک قوا ہے Said, Ya Rasulullah, you gave such a big oath. Ya Rasulullah, I give oath with you that Musaylama is a liar. And not just me, this small dog of the door of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is the refuge of the whole world. My testimony is by the number of sand particles and the number of the stars in the skies. My testimony is with the testimony of the angels and the of the angels of the earth and the skies. And by my testimony is with the testimony of the angels that carry the, the arsh of Allah. And my testimony is with the testimony of Allah Himself that Musaylama is a liar. Allah. Look at his love, how he reacts, as, he's, as though he's talking to Rasulullah when he reacts to this, right? And there is a, another interesting masala. Sayyid Didar Ali Shah Sahib from Lahore, who was originally from Alwar in India, then he migrated to Lahore and he built one of the greatest um, Darul Ulooms 
Ala Hazrat Khalifa and my grandfather's teacher also. Peer Sayyid Idar Ali Shah Sahib Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Ali Muhaddithi Ali Wali. He wrote a question from Lahore to Ala Hazrat Al Bareli. And he asked that there is a speaker here, a public speaker who claims to be an alim. And in his speech, he said, Nabi Rasulatu Salam is Bechare Yadim. Ma'adallah. And he is an impoverished Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam uh, orphan. And the context was derogatory, the way he spoke. What is the hukum? Now, he called Nabi Alayhi Salam Bechara Yatim, and that was the question. Ala Hazrat Ali Rahma responds and he starts answering the question. So, look, how did that person refer to Nabi Alayhi Salam? In, by calling him an orphan. Nabi Alayhi Salam responded and opened his question by giving 37 adjectival praises to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he said, Huzuri Akdas Qasimun Ni'am. Malik al Ard, Warikab in Umam, Moti, Munim, Kuthum, Tayyim, Wali, Wali, Ali, Ali, Kashi for Kurab, Rati Burutab, Moin, Kafi, Hafiz, Wafi, Shafi, Shafi, Afu, Afi, Gafur, Jamil, Aziz, Jalil, Wahab, Karim, Ghani, Azim, Khalifa, Mutlake, Hazrate, Rab, Malikun Naya, Nas, the Yanul Arab, Malikun Nas, the Yanul Arab. Waliyul Fazal, Jaliyul Afzal, Rafiul Amsal, Muntaniul Amsal, Sallallahu Ta'alaihi, Sallallahu Ta'alaihi, Wa Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam, Wa Sharrafa Wa Azam. How dare he say Nabi Alayhi Salam is just a yateen? This is my Nabi. You see, Ahmad, the vigor and the zeal and the ishq of adab of Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam in our great Imam. Sayyidi Imam Ahmad Ridha Khan was recognized for this in his. So I have in front of me a, a new. Uh, uh, Hashi of Taysir. This is basically a marginal a commentary that he wrote to a famous book of hadith, the Taysir of Imam al Munawi, the Sharh of al Jab al Sagir. And he was only a student at the age of 12 when he was writing this commentary, by the way. Alhamdulillah, at the age of 12, and we have that published today. Right? He began writing this at the age of 12. So I want to tell you what his mind thinking process is at this, at this young age. Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Ali Rahman. Listen to this carefully. There is a hadith in Al Jami' al Sagheer that says, Kana ida arad al -hajj. I want to show you adab and ishq in the writing of Sayyidi Allah Hazrat al Rahma, especially in his Arabic writings. Sayyidi Allah Hazrat al Rahma, he says, there's a hadith in, of the Prophet in, in uh, Jami' al Sagheer. Kana ida in Al Jami' al Sagheer, Kana ida arad al Haja abada. When Nabi Rasulullah wanted to answer the call of nature, okay, and he was traveling, he would go far away out of the sight of people. Okay, so Imam al Munawi is writing commentary to this and he says, la yusma'u li kharijihi sawtun wa la yushammu rihuhu. Imam al Munawi says the reason why Nabi Islam would go so far out is so that nobody could hear him, nobody could hear him answering the call of nature, and so that nobody could smell. Okay, nobody could smell. Okay, so. Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma responds. Subhanallah. Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma responds. And he says, This is not the reason why Nabi Islam would go so far because somebody would hear Nabi Islam answering the call of nature. Or that there would be a bad odor from him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No. Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma says, Aba'ada fi dhahabi li kathrati hayaihi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reason why he would go far away from these sight of people is because he was bashful and he had shyness sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was very shy sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And then he says about the two reasons that you gave. Allah Hazrat Ali Rahma said, Amma ma dhakarahu sharihu fa awaluhu ghayru mustahsanin adaban. As for the first thing that Imam Munawi said, he said this is... This is not desirable what you said about the Prophet ﷺ, that there would be a sound from him. He said, this is not desirable saying this about the Prophet ﷺ is not desirable. Right? وَآخِرُهُ بَاطِلٌ وَاقِعًا As for the second thing that you said, that is completely batil, that is completely void, that there would be a bad odor from his sallallahu alayhi wa sallam excess, his fluid of his body. Allah has said this is batil qat'an. This explanation is totally unacceptable. Why? فَلَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْهُ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم شَيْءٌ يُكْرَهُ أَبَدًا There was nothing that people would dislike from his body. 
And then he said, وَكَانَ إِذَا قَضَى الْحَاجَةَ إِبْتَلَعَتْهَا الْأَرْضُ وَقَاحَتْ لَهَا رَائِحَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ فَصَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ وَعَلَى آلِهِ قَدْرَ طِيبِهِ وَجَمَالِهِ وَجَاهِهِ وَجَلَالِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم When it is known in hadith, every time he صلى الله عليه وسلم would answer the call of nature and he would relieve himself, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it incumbent upon the earth to swallow the excess of the Prophet Sallallahu So where would the bad smell come from Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Nothing comes bad from him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, there are hadith that say whenever he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam finished where he finished, there would be a sweet, sweet fragrance coming from that place. And say the Aisha radiallahu anha who lived in the house with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Nabi Rasulullah would answer the call of nature. Nabi Rasulullah, there was an area in his, uh, to the side of his house Sayyidah Aisha said she never ever, this is a narration mentioned, that she did not see anything of that kind and that whenever he came, there would be a beautiful fragrance in that area. Okay, so this is his response to the adab of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. Another example, right, I want to show you is from Imam, Imam al-Tahawi, right, Imam al-Tahawi. So this is, as you can see, this is a manuscript. This is a manuscript. And this is a copy of Sayyidi Ali Hazrat Rahman's um, uh, manuscript. This is his hashiya, his marginal commentary on Sharhu uh, uh, Mushkil al Athar of Imam al Tahawi, who is from the pious predecessors. Now, in, uh, so a little bit of context, right? There are hadiths that say, do not give me virtue over Yunus and Musa, for example. Don't, don't say that I am superior to other prophets. There are hadiths like this, right? And so our scholars have responded to this hadith because our Nabi Islam is the greatest of the prophets, right? So what does this hadith mean? Scholars gave different answers. Now when Allah Hazrat read, was reading these hadiths in Imam al-Tahawi's book, Imam al-Tahawi wrote two books where he dealt with this topic. Sharhu Mushkil al-Athar, Sharhu Ma'an al-Athar. So in Sharhu Ma'an al-Athar, when Imam al-Tahawi was mentioning these hadiths, he didn't write any response to them. He didn't explain them. Mm-hmm. So Allah Hazrat got very, very disturbed by this. And he got distressed. Why isn't Tahawi defending the maqam of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Why isn't Imam Tahawi explaining, you know Aqeedah Tahawiyah you study? The same author, right? Why isn't he explaining what these hadiths mean? Why isn't he contextualizing these hadiths? So I'm not going to read the whole Arabic, right? But Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Rahman says, a point came, a point came when I was, I was so distressed by Imam al-Tahawi not answering these hadiths and explaining that our Nabi is the most superior of Allah's messengers and prophets. Why isn't he saying this? Why isn't he explaining this? He said, a point came. Whereas he's such a great Imam, right? And this is a muscle of ijma from the time of the Sahaba, right? This, all Muslims agree on this, that he's superior to all the prophets and messengers. In fact, he's the greatest of Allah's creation. And Allah wrote a book called Tajalli al-Yaqeen And he presented 100 hadiths to prove Nabi Salam is superior to all prophets and messengers And is the best of Allah's creation 100 hadiths in this book In Tajalli al-Yaqeen yeah? So Allah Hazrat Rahman says I came to a point right? He says لَكِنْ كَانَ قَلْبِ يُنَازِعُنِي وَيُبَارِينِي نَفُوزًا مِمَّا يُعْتِهِ ظَاهِرُ هَذَا الْكَلَامِ he said, my heart began competing with me and challenging me regarding the matter of Tahawi. And Allah forbid, a time came when it was very close that I would take Tahawi out of my heart. You see this? A time came when my heart was arguing with me and I was very close to actually taking him out of my heart. Well, billah, that this is when he was reading Sharhu Ma'an al Then he said, Ila an tudrikani rahmatu rabbi. Then the mercy of my Lord came to my help. Fawaqaftu ala kalam al imami fi mushkil al athar. Fahalla al mushkilu wa azal al ghubar. Walhamdulillah al aziz al ghaffar. He said then, I saw his other book called Mushkil al-Athar in which he answered all of those hadiths and those objections and he proved that Nabi Imam al-Tahabi proved in his other book that Nabi alayhi salam is the most superior of Allah's creation. This is the standard of Allah Hazrat al-Rahman. Okay, is how do you stand with the ijma of the Ahlul Sunnah? 
Where do you stand with the consensus opinions of the ijma of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? Where do scholars stand with the daruriyat of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah? The absolute necessities of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And even with a giant imam like, imam like a Tahawi, this is his comments. Because he knew what the ijma is. Right? And no scholar is above the ijma of this ummah. Remember this. The ijma of this ummah is ma'asum. But no scholar is ma'asum. But the ijma of this ummah is ma'asum. This is promised in the hadiths of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. So, these were some examples that I gave you from the uh, works of Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Ali Rahma regarding his adab and ishq for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallam. And there's a famous narration that you must have heard that when he passed away, he bequeathed that he, his grave should be to the height of his blessed head. So that when the Prophet ﷺ comes to his grave, he could stand up in his grave and meet him ﷺ out of respect. So is this narration true? And can a grave be the length of one's height? And the answer is, our fit books say it is mustahab to make the grave as deep as the height of the person. So Allah Rahman, when he gave this advice, this was in line, of, in line with the fit books. Right? It was in line with the fiqh books that he wanted his grave to be as tall as his own height. This is Fatawa Hindiya and all the other major uh, fiqh books of the Hanafi Madhab men- mentioned this categorically. And I asked one of the ulama in Bareilly who were present when Mufti Azam Hind Shah Mustafa Raza Khan's grave was dug next to Allah Hazrat Rahma. He said, Yes, the people who stood inside the grave, the grave of Allah Hazrat right next to the grave of Mufti Azam Hind was of the height of one person. So people have actually seen this and this is actually true. That the Prophet wasallam, this is how much adab and ishq he had that he wanted to stand up for the Prophet wasallam when he would see him in the blessed grave. And Sayyidi Allah Hazrat Rahma was remembered for igniting the ishq of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at Mustafa Jali Rahmat Bilak Salam flowing off the tongues of children who cannot make a sentence of Urdu and they know Mustafa Jali Rahmat. It's a claim throughout the whole world. You can go anywhere in the world and there's an Urdu speaking. In fact, you heard that Shaykh from Iraq who lives in Lahore and he reads Mustafa Jali Rahmat and he's not a he's not Pakistani or Indian, cannot speak a word of Urdu and he knows Mustafa Jali Rahmat Bilak Salam. Shabai Bazmi Hidayat Bilak Salam. A sign of Summa Yudahul Kabul fil Art, a sign of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's acceptance on this earth. Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Imam Ahl Sunnat radiallahu ta'ala anhu through his hadaiki bakshish, through his poetry, Sayyidi Ala Hazrat Rahma revived the hearts of the believers. What did he say about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Madina Tayyibah? I want to finish on this. He said, Nazar ek chaman se do chaar hai. Na chaman chaman bhi nisar hai. Ajab uske gul ki bahar hai. Ke bahar bul bul ezaar hai. Ye saman, ye sausan o yasman. یہ بنفشہ سنبل و نسترن گل و سر و لالا بھرا چمن وہی ایک جلوہ ہزار ہے یہ سبا سلک وہ کلی چٹک یہ زبا چہک لب جو چھلک یہ مہت جلک یہ چمک تمک سب اسی کے دم کی بہار ہے بعدب جھکال و سر ویلا کہ میں نام لوں گل و باغ کا گل تر محمد مصطفیٰ چمن ان کا پاک دیار ہے I just want to explain this because we hear this but we don't understand this. This is one of his most profound kalams he wrote on the love of Al-Madinat Al-Munawwara and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, my sight is fondly in love with a beautiful garden. My, lo- my sight is fondly in love with a beautiful garden. The entire gardens of this world are sacrificed to it. The bloom of its flower, there is a flower in this garden. Allah says the bloom of its flower is so unique that blossom itself is a weeping nightingale itself. Blossom, spring is in love with this flower and weeps in his love. Even Blossom is fondly in love and passionately in love with this flower. And then he says, He mentions nine flowers. 
These are all flowers. Ye saman, ye sosanu, ye asman, ye banafsha sumbulu nastaran. He says these jasmines, these lilies and this lavender, the violets and the hyacinths and the nasturtiums. These are all flowers. The garden filled with flowers, cypresses and tulips. All of this, it is the one manifestation in a thousand forms. Subhanallah. All of this is one manifestation of him sallallahu alayhi wa in a thousand forms. They all are mirrors of his beauty, all these flowers. What does this mean? The, the, the blowing of the breeze, the blossoming of the bud, the chirping of the birds, and the sounds of waves at the shores of rivers. This fragrance, this glimpse, this sparkle, this glow. All are the vitality of his single breath. They are all the vitality of his single breath. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said, what is this garden? And who is this flower that I'm talking about? Bow your head in reverence as I take the name of the flower in the garden. Bow your head, bow your heads in respect as I take the name of this garden and its flower. Gule tar Muhammad Mustafa. Chamanun ka paak tayar hai. The flesh flower is Muhammad Mustafa and the garden is his pure land, Madinah Tayyibah. This level of intimacy and fondness and ishq and adab for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And lastly, I would like to say, Honestly, one of the best things that you can do studying the deen, you will never regret it and studying the Urdu language. Teach your children the deen, spend time with your local ulama, sit in their company and you see how far that will take you and them, your children in life. And learn the Urdu language, wallahi, it is one of the sweetest language, languages that will connect you with Medina and Sahib Medina. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and accept what we have said.